God is calling us to love and to unity. Because there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Amen? Amen. All right. In Genesis, the very beginning of our scriptures, we see that God is creating the world. We see the first trait we learn about God is that God is creative. And as a musician, an artist, I love that. Because that means that by extension, that we are people who are made in God's image, we are inherently creative too. So if there's someone, if someone has told you you can't sing or whatever, that's a lie. God has made you creative, right? And so God looks at what God has made. From the smallest subatomic particles to the largest spinning and swirling galaxies. And I can just see God with a big smile on God's face says, yes, <laughs> this is But when God looks at humanity, God looks at his symbolic Adam and says, whoa, you are not just good. You are very good. God looks at us and God says, you, you, and 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 all the people in this room, and all of the people in the world, regardless of who they are, or what they've done, or what they believe, God looks at us and says, you are very good. God looks at us and he says, you are my precious, beloved child. I have made you for goodness because I am good. Now, there's always a little bit more in the story, right? You go forward a little bit farther to Genesis 2, 18, and for the first time, God says something is not good. God looks at Adam and says, the man is alone. That is not good. I will make for him a helper as a do you see what God's proclaiming here? God has made us for community. God doesn't want us to be alone. God has made, God has made us to be in relationship with ourselves, with one another, and with God. Just as God is in relationship and community with God's self in the Trinity. God says to us, do not be afraid of anything, especially don't be afraid to be the way that I have made you. And Zephaniah says, God rejoices over you and sings over you every morning. Why would you ever give in to anything we know in life? Remember Moses, who was rightly afraid of leading a liberation movement against the Pharaoh and taking away Pharaoh's precious energy and his slave labor. But God says to him, I am with you. Think of the prophets, right? Who every time imperialistic forces or tendencies encroached upon the Israelites, God asked the prophets to call the people back to themselves. He says, do not be afraid. I am with you. Don't let fear rule your action. Think of Jesus, right? Jesus is sleeping on a boat. And a massive storm comes up. And his disciples wake up and say, Jesus, get up, man. We are going to die. It's going down right now. And Jesus provides the most inexplicable comment. He stands there and says, why are you afraid? <laughs> I'm sorry, Jesus. Have you checked the weather? <laughs> right? Like, we're going to die tonight, man. And he says, why are you afraid? The implication being that he was with them. And later in the gospel, when he gives the promise to the apostles that he will be with us to the end of the age, that promise is good for us too. God is with us. God calls us not to be afraid, but to be with us in this community church of people. Remember Paul, right? His great theological treatise, Romans, in Romans, Romans 8, he says, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing in the world. You know, in, in, in many respects, Paul's world was similar to our world. A lot of respects it wasn't. But very much like our own time, there was division everywhere. In his letter to the church in Galatia, Paul spends the entire time addressing division. And it was a division rooted in fear. You know, Paul spent a lot of his life working against divisions. And you know, the Galatian church was divided between Greeks and circumcised Jews, and their social standing and their cultural heritage was being used as a wedge to divide them from one another. And I love what Paul does here in Galatians 3. He 
points their back, a piece of their baptismal liturgy back to them. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, and in quoting Genesis, male and female. Paul says there can be no social division in God's family because God has made us to be more than equals. God has made us to be more than equals. God has made us to be sister and brother in God's family. United in our beautiful diversity by our baptism. And you know, just some of just Paul's words with our 21st century years sound kind of you know, antiquated and conservative. But when we really, in those times, in this Greco Roman world, this is revolutionary. This is revolutionary, and in some sense, it still is today. And if we believe the Bible still has something to say to us today, then we need to use Galatians 3.28, a text like it, as a theological cornerstone for our reflections on what it is for us to be a community of little Christ. To be people trying to be like Christ and to be in the body of Christ together. You know, Paul had a vision for the church. I hope you'll hear this. Paul's vision of the church in which it should be a movement of people gathered together around one table. Richard B. Hayes is a scholar and he said this, as if the church is called to be an alternative community that prefigures the new creation in the midst of a world that resists God's justice. Did you hear that? The church, you and me, are supposed to be a new creation. We are supposed to be an alternative community that prefigures that new creation in a world that resists God's justice. God is calling you and me to be different. God is calling us to be the light of God, open to what God is doing, and available to be pulled into the future that Christ is making. Now, I'll tell you, one of my theological heroes in the faith and teachers is a man by the name of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Look at that. How could you not love him, right? <laughs> awesome. So great. And he has given the world an incredible number of gifts. But one that I think speaks so powerfully to where the church is headed in the 21st century is the introduction that he's given us to the African theological and philosophical concept of Ubuntu. And it's a total language that they say it. Ubuntu. Give it a look. Nice. Ubuntu. Isn't that fun? Yeah. And Ubuntu, the essence of it is this. I cannot be who God is calling me to be unless you can be who God's calling you to be. I can't be who I'm made to be unless you're able to be who you are called to be. We can't experience the fullness of God's dream for the beloved community without recognizing that each of us carries the image of Christ in ourselves. Now, you need we don't want one another, but we need one another. And I am completely convinced that this is part of God's dream for us, to be a people who live together in unity and harmony and wholeness, but yet recognize we are mutually dependent upon one another. We are connected in the most profound ways. You know, there's no such thing as a self-made person, amen? None of us are in this place tonight without the help of other people. And when you hear me preach, you're not, this is not me. Part of it is, but you're hearing Phil Stovall, my dad, and Sally Stovall, my mother, and all my teachers. Right? We are not self-made people. We are made to be together, to be family in the body of Christ, celebrating the diverse and beautiful ways that God has made us, but yet united in our baptismal identity. We need each other because we depend upon each other for many things, especially what you're doing this weekend. The church needs this. Trust me when I tell you, right? Everyone in this room has a different way of seeing the world and a separate set of gifts, and we need that from one another. You have gifts that I don't have, and I have gifts that you don't have. You see the world in one way, I see it in another way. And imagine if we were actually attending to one another, we could really see what God is doing. You know, the body of Christ needs its eyes to be eyes and its feet to be feet, and when it's healthy, everything is working together. And it's fundamental for Ubuntu than liberating theology. Because how can I know who God calls you to be? Because I don't know you. We have to be in dialogue with one another. We have to be attentive to one another. We have to come around the Lord's table in 
meet together in the presence of the risen and spirit of God. And that is when we really begin to realize that we are the image characters of God. And when we're able to do that, when we're able to see the Imago Dei, the image of God in each other, we can see that this false binary, fear-based, dual thinking is unworthy of God, it is unworthy of the beloved community, and it is unworthy of the future that Christ is building with us. We've got so many better dreams than that. You know, we are to live and to love and to serve. Now, as a sign to the world of what it is to be citizens in the kingdom of God, you and I are to be what it looks like when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. All right. We are to be a community who celebrates that diversity that God has so blessed us with. And we need that rich tapestry with God of what it looks like to live life together. And when we do that, we will become a movement again. The student movement will become a movement again. The United Methodist Church will become a movement again. But here's the thing, I promise you, we can't do it without each and every one of you. You have to bring us forward into the new world. You have got to be the hands and feet of Christ because God has no one but us. God made you with all your unique gifts and graces and way of seeing the world, and we need that, especially if you are feeling a bit maladjusted toward the injustices that are perpetrated by the church and by the world. There was a man who spoke here. I read this last night as a preacher. It terrified me. You know, back in the day, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke here at a United Methodist student movement, a bit Methodist student movement, and he told us so clearly that human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. Be who God has made you to be, because we need that. You know, history is filled with progress and regress. And the progress seems to come fastest when the church behaves as a movement and not as an institution. Remember Francis of Assisi, you know Francis, right? God called him to prepare the church. And he did so. And in so doing, he terrified the church authorities. And they did one of the great big tricks of the day. They turned him into a saint instead of a person, so they didn't have to deal with what he was saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in spite of all that, Francis ignited a movement where thousands of people could give their lives in love and service to the least of these. Remember Margaret Fell, who in 1666 partnered, I believe, with God while she was in prison to write a book called Women Speaking Justified. She believed that rightly women have something to say in the church. And in so doing, she fed a movement and many movements since trying to make Galatians 3, 28 a reality. Remember Dr. King, who though he was only 26 years old, and for those of you that are on the five and six year plan, you're not far from that. <laughs> 26 years old, and his colleagues said, we need you to leave this busboy crowd. He said, cool. But he did. And became the face of a movement preaching liberation and reconciliation for all of God's people. Remember 50 years ago this month, the Freedom Riders. College students who gave so much of themselves and inspired people to greater courage. Show that they can, they can hurt you, they can take your life, but they cannot take the word that God has given you. You know, remember Mother Teresa, who after she died, you read her journals, and it was very clear she had large doubts about the very existence of God, but she stepped out on faith and partnered with God and inspired the world, serving the poorest of the poor on this planet. I'm sure many of you have read Shane Claiborne, yeah? Yeah. Woo! Remember Shane, who right now is doing a new thing, building a new monastic movement, but speaking a word to the world and a vibrant word to the institutional church. You know, God has seen it fit to bring you here. God has given you something to say. You might not believe it, but you just got to find your voice because we need you. You've got something to say to one another, to me, to the church, and to the world. And you are not alone. You are not alone. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering and praying for you to become the people God has made you to be. You know, but with the exception of shame, most of that stuff in some sense was then, and this is now. 
we've got an entirely new set of challenges.